Matt Easton here for Scholar Gladiatoria. So um, recently I did a video talking about uh, why bucklers were so popular. In fact, there are many reasons why bucklers were, were popular compared to shields, shall we say, in the late medieval period. But the reason that I really focused on was the fact that a buckler you can carry anywhere. You can wear it on your belt, you kind of don't even notice it's there. A shield, on the other hand, is is very cumbersome and big and a uh, nuisance and there are all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't want to carry it around all the time. That kind of spurred me into thinking, uh, there's a lot of you out there I know who, uh, obviously there's a lot of gamers out there who play computer games, but there's a lot of you who are doing um, things like role playing games as well. And I started thinking, well, probably actually there's some misconceptions about what's realistic to go adventuring with or travelling with. And in actual fact, history does give us pretty good answers to these questions because, of course, we've got um, we've got descriptive accounts from the medieval period, which, of course, is where most kind of fantasy or role-playing settings are kind of set in, um, where people did go travelling, and we kind of know what kind of gear they took with them. Um, and obviously, it varied depending on the environment, depending how you know how risky the environment was, how dangerous the road was expected to be, but a famous example of course which I fairly often refer to is um, Geoffrey Chaucer's Pilgrims who go to Canterbury in the Canterbury Tales and they are pretty much all, at least the men, are pretty much all armed which of course is interesting because medieval England in the 14th century was relatively safe relatively law-abiding. Yes, there were brigands, Robin Hood type uh, bands that you did get in forests. In fact, <laughs> ironically in the 14th century the name Robin Hood had become a name that anybody who was an outlaw living living in the woods and basically um, uh, mugging people, robbing people, uh, became known as Robin Hood and lots of these people who were caught, arrested, um, they wouldn't give their real name because they didn't want repercussions for their f friends and family and so they actually gave their name as Robin Hood. This has led lots of people to trying to locate an original Robin Hood to try and find in the rec records the first person who used the name Robin Hood. Um, and there's been some good books written on the subject if you're interested in that. Um, so yes, there were outlaws in the 14th century um, and obviously in periods where um, there were lots of soldiers coming back from the Hundred Years' War, for example. Um, unfortunately, when you've got lots of fighting men and suddenly the, wars doesn't, uh, the war isn't happening anymore, for example, in 1360 there was a peace between England and France, uh, and you suddenly got these roaming bands. Luckily, for the English at least, they mostly stayed up in continental Europe because that was where money was to be made as mercenaries. And of course, most famously, the uh, free companies like the White Company and the Great Company uh, formed up and went down to um, Italy, northern Italy, and hired themselves out. And these were these were mercenary companies, and they were mixture of, of uh, English and French, and some Flemish and some Burgundian, um, some Germans. There were lots of German mercenaries at that time fighting in the Hundred Years' War on both French and English sides. Um, and so they were a mixture of nationalities and they basically banded together. They didn't care about the old allegiances because they were just in it for the money. They banded together and formed large companies, um, the free companies as they were called, and, uh, and basically hired themselves out to any Italian city-state who would pay them. And very often they would change sides because another city-state would offer to pay them more. And one of the most famous people who did this was Sir John Hawkwood. Um, but um, there were therefore lots of people travelling around medieval Europe who were mercenaries, soldiers, obviously there were merchants and people who travelled as part of their more peaceful life as well. Um, so we do have a fair sense of what it was realistic for a small group of people to transport and carry around. Now, if you think about um, weapons and armour, for a, for a second, there are certain there are certain elements of weapons and armor that it's just not practical to wear all the time. Okay, for example, I mentioned the large shield. A large shield is still a perfectly valid uh, object of war throughout the Middle Ages. They didn't disappear, as some books will tell you. Um, they just stopped being large shields stopped being used by the most heavily armored guys, the so-called knights but they did continue being used by more lightly armoured um, soldiers, infantry. Um, and indeed they conti continued being used, used by some types of lighter cavalry as well. 
Um, so a large shield is something that you can only really transport around all the time and do your daily business if you've got a horse or a donkey or some other animal to transport it around. You can't really wear and carry around conveniently a large shield. Um, as far as I can think, the only people that I can think of who did regularly carry relatively large shields around, and we're talking now about kind of 24 inch diameter, so two foot diameter uh, targes, uh, you find this to be the case in um, Scotland, in the Scottish Highlands, uh, and also in India and Persia. Um, it seems to have been not uncommon to carry shields around up to about this size bigger than that size it gets very cumbersome very inconvenient a shield of about 24 inches you can wear on your back or hanging off your shoulder it's a bit inconvenient uh, it's certainly not as easy and not as convenient as carrying a buckler a buckler is much easier to carry around much lighter you don't even notice it's there um, but a shield up to about 24 inches you can carry but you have to bear in mind if you carry a larger shield you're probably going to carry less other stuff and this is one of the themes that I want to get over in this video is that if you carry more of one thing you're going to have to carry less of something else okay so pole arms well pole arms you can only really carry in your hand uh, or strapped to a horse okay and, and equally if it's strapped to a horse it can't really be a pike you can't strap a 16 foot long pike to a horse because the horse is just going to get it's going to keep hitting things and getting stuck going between trees and walking around corners so that's stupid but there are medium length uh, pole arms up to about you know 8 foot maybe that are convenient possibly to carry in your hand or to attach to a horse but remember or a cart possibly but remember that if you are carrying a pole arm that's your hand occupied. That's, that means you can't carry something else in your hand. And whenever you do something, you're going to have to put the pole arm down. And sometimes you need both hands to do a very simple thing. For example, if you're carrying, um, if you're carrying, or if you imagine if you're eating and leading a horse by the reins, okay, you can't do both of those things and have either of your hands occupied by a pole arm. You need one hand to eat and drink, and you need one hand to hold the reins of the horse. And this is assuming, of course, that your horse is covered in all your kit, so you therefore can't ride it. And that's the other thing to remember. A horse, you can use as a pack animal, but you can't usually use as a pack animal and ride on it at the same time, because you can't fit both of you on the back of the horse, okay? And the horse is not going to like that either. Um, so think about what your hands are occupied doing. Now a person, this is all assuming you've got a horse, now think about the, um, well let's move away for a second, we'll move back to weapons in a minute, uh, weapons and armour, but moving away to your other stuff, you've got to assume if you're travelling there are certain things you pretty much have to have, okay, you need some kind of bedding unless you're in the desert, or even if you're in the desert actually because deserts get pretty cold at night, but unless you're in a very temperate uh, kind of environment, in most parts of the world, in most times of the year, you're going to need something to sleep on or under. Okay, so you need something to sleep on under. You presumably have spare clothes. Um, you might not. You might stink to high heaven. Um, but you'll probably have spare clothes. You'll also have probably eating utensils and maybe a couple of tools. Um, you'll probably have food, hopefully, unless you're starving. You'll probably, unless you want to die, have water. Water's really heavy, okay? Um, so you have all of these things that you need to live, essentially. It's a kind of nasty an analogy to make, but if you think about a homeless person living on the streets today, usually they have a big backpack and in that backpack they have their essentials that they need. They have their bedding, they have their, their spare clothes, uh, they have bits of food that they uh, keep in, in reserve, um, they probably have a couple of tools of various kinds, maybe an eating utensil, maybe a cup, that kind of stuff. Okay, You need all of those things if you're going to go travelling in this medieval environment. Okay, So those things, either you're carrying them or they're on your horse. Okay, You've now got to, which, whichever one of those is the case, you've got to factor that into what additional weapons and armour you can carry. So we've talked about weapons, um, sidearms are always the easiest thing to carry around. So swords, axes, maces, um, these kind of things that you can easily wear. 
And on that tack, I'll just point out, it's generally speaking easier to wear a sword than it is to wear an axe. Axes, generally speaking, you have to wear them with the head upwards, because otherwise they swing around and hit you in the leg and it hurts, possibly hurts your person standing next to you as well. Um, if they're head upwards, you need to think of, this isn't reenactment world where all the weapons are blunt. The edge of the axe is going to be sharp, so how are you going to store that axe head up with a sharp blade against your body without continually injuring yourself, or at least it being very painful against your ribs or your hip or your crotch? You don't want a sharp axe rubbing against your crotch all day, I can assure you. Um, so you've got to think about how you're going to wear the weapon, how you're going to wear the sidearm. This is yet another reason why swords were very popular. Swords are very easy to wear. Um, they just go in a scabbard. Okay? Um, so you've got a sidearm like a sword. You'll probably have an additional sidearm that doubles as a tool, i.e. a knife. Okay? You pretty much need a knife. Everybody living in this kind of environment needs a knife for all sorts of jobs. So you need a knife or a dagger, you need a sword, you might carry something small like a buckler, um, uh, in addition to all the clothes and all your living gear you've got. Additional weapons on top of that, well, you could carry a polearm. Uh, as I've mentioned, you have to then carry the polearm in your hand or attached to your horse. Either of those things are quite inconvenient, so factor that in when you're thinking about what you can realistically cart around all day. Okay? Next up, missile weapons. Okay, well missile weapons are actually very useful things because obviously they can do things which hand weapons can't. You can, um, you can take out a sentry without being close to them. You can hunt with them and therefore get more food for yourself, be it a crossbow, longbow, a recurve bow. You can hunt with all of those bows. Um, but remember that a missile weapon has to be stored somehow. Crossbows, bows, longbows are not the easiest things to carry around. Longbows certainly aren't. Longbow has to really be carried in your hand. If you're carrying a longbow in your hand, then you can't carry a polearm in your hand. You could attach the longbow to the horse. You could attach a longbow and a polearm to the horse. But you have to remember, if you want to use them, you have to detach them from the horse in order to use them. So bear those things in mind. Um, one exception to the bow rule, bow, bows are generally speaking difficult to transport except if you carry them. In a lot of movies people have them kind of strung diagonally across their bodies. This doesn't work very well with actual bows because actual bows have a lot of tension between the bow and the string. Uh, if you try and do that with a, with a bow that actually has some power to it, it's quite painful actually. I've tried to do that with long bows over the years and I've been able to wear them for about five minutes before it gets so uncomfortable I just take them off. The reason they do it in movies and films is because they're using incredibly light and weak bows because obviously you know you see them standing there for five minutes at full draw. They're silly bows that are only about 15 or 20 pounds draw weight and those you can go you can go like this, you can stretch them easily and of course they're more comfortable to wear because there's no pressure between the string and the bow. Um, next, uh, the one exception to wearing bows is the sort of Eastern European Turkish and Asian style of wearing a recurve bow in a kind of hip um, holster almost, uh, kind of like a quiver that also includes the bow. These were usually worn on the horse but they could be worn off a belt as well. So they're a kind of exception and you see in Mongolian and Persian and Turkish and Indian art you see these type of bow holsters. They're very cool things but they don't really exist in Europe at that time because of course a longbow is too long to fit in that type of holster. Um, the other problem with uh, missile weapons is of course arrows or bolts, depending if it's a crossbow. Um, you need to store them somewhere as well. Now arrows and bolts are actually quite, they can be quite heavy and they're also quite inconvenient things. They, uh, if you have them in a quiver, you're always kind of bashing them on things. Uh, forget back quivers. Back quivers weren't used very much historically. They did exist historically but they weren't very popular. Main reason because if you have arrows sticking up here you're forever hitting them on doorways, low hanging branches, you get they're rubbish for hunting because they make lots of noise as you go through brush uh, where, with tree leaves and branches and stuff hanging down. Often the arrows get caught and they get pulled out of the thing. If you bend forward at all, often all the arrows fall out of the... So back quivers are rubbish. Okay, I have a back quiver and I've used it for many years. They're fun, they look cool, but they're actually not very practical. Throughout most of history, most arrows and bolts have been carried at the waist, because that's where they're practical, out of the way, and they don't get caught on things like doorways and branches. Okay, so you've got to factor that in. If you're wearing a quiver, a sword, a dagger, and you've got a bow in your hand, 
you've only got one spare hand probably to hold the reins of your horse which has got all your living gear your uh, your um, bed bed rolls and all of your food and all of your other stuff on it you're getting weighed down now okay let's let leave weapons aside let's talk about armor for a second so spending all day in plate armor is horrific okay for any of you out there who do reenactment and have plate armor um, I have plate armor but I don't do reenactment so I have never spent a whole day in my plate armor and I don't want to okay there are mentions in history uh, for example on the Agincourt campaign the English army was trying to get back uh, to the coast to run away from the French army and the French army was trailing it on the other side of the river therefore the English army knew that they could be attacked at any time for that reason, the English men-at-arms stayed in their armour and there's some suggestion that they were brown because they were covered in rust because it was really nasty weather, they were getting rained on, it was damp, they were sleeping on the ground. Um, so they were staying in their armour day in, day out for about a week and that would have been horrific, would have been really uncomfortable. Armour is cold, it saps the heat out of you, it gets, it gets very hot when you're hot and when the weather's hot and it gets very cold when you're cold and, and the outside is cold, okay? So armour is, plate armour is not pleasant to wear, it saves your life, it is incredibly invulnerable to all sorts of weapons, it makes you a human tank, it really, it, it really does the job at what it's designed at, but what it doesn't do is it is horrible to live in, okay? So if you're not going to wear the plate armor, plate armor all day, where are you going to put it? Okay, I have plate armor, and it takes three large boxes to store it. Okay, it's, it takes up a lot of space, and it's heavy. And remember, you don't only have the plate armor; you have the padded acaton that you wear first. Then you have mail, either a mail shirt or mail voiders for the gaps. Then you have the plate armor. Remember, the plate armor consists of helmet, cuirass, so a breastplate and backplate arms and legs and gauntlets and feet okay that's a lot of plate it's it's uh, weighs usually about 60 pounds in weight um, and it, it takes up a lot of space because all of these plates form most of them form cylinders either cylinders around your arm parts or a big cylinder around your chest part or a cylinder around your head and these these take up a lot of volume where are you going to store them on the poor old horse again i presume then remember not only have you got to store it which is heavy and takes up space, but you've also got to protect it. You've got to protect it from the elements, otherwise it's just going to get covered in rust in a matter of days because the first, the first downpour of rain is going to soak whatever it's stored in and it's all just going to go rusty, including your mail, and your mail could get all rusted solid and not work properly. Okay, so plate armour, not great to go travelling with at all. It's a complete pain in the ass. There is a reason why the people who owned and wore plate armour had uh, pages and squires and people to look after them and dress them and uh, polish the armour every evening and keep it oiled and look after it and transport it in carts and all this kind of stuff. Okay, So travelling, adventuring and plate armour, it's not realistic. It's stupid. Okay, So lighter types of armour. What types of armour? Well, I can see a situation whereby you could feasibly go travelling for fair amounts of time relatively comfortably with a mail shirt and a brigandine and a helmet. Okay, and these were the basic armors of the late medieval period that were very, very universally popular. Um, so if you think about uh, these type of flexible, so a brigandine is flexible, it's small plates underneath a fabric or leather covering. Mail is obviously flexible and mail's not too heavy and it obviously it breathes because it's full of holes. Um, and uh, a helmet is fine, you, a bit of plate armor for your head, it's the best. If you're going to have any plate armor, have it on your head. Um, and potentially a couple of other bits of plate armour might be acceptable, uh, you know, some gauntlets or maybe some leg armour or something. But leg armour is not very comfortable and it's not very nice to ride in and it's, you can't really run very well in it and this kind of stuff. So it's not very versatile in everyday life. So there we go. Um, there's a brief overview of, of what you might think about when you're... Um, either thinking about travelling as a medieval person, whether you're doing a reenactment and you're doing an impersonation of an English archer on campaign, or an English billman on campaign, or a French billman on campaign, um, or whether you're doing role playing games or even computer games to an extent, uh, think about what is what could I actually live? Imagine you're out camping and hiking. Yeah, think about camping and hiking, and all you've got to assist you in that really is a horse, um, and 
you know, unless you're very high status, you've got no other people to help you transport your stuff. So it's you and a horse. What is realistic in terms of weapons and armour to carry? Remember, it's got to be carried somehow, either on your body or in your hand or on the horse, in addition to all the things you need just to live. Your, your bedding and your food and your water and all of these things. So I hope that helps you think a little bit more about both the medieval period and maybe kind of imaginary fantasy periods in a slightly different way. Cheers, guys.